They can drop 80,000 feet within a matter of a few seconds. Not only that, they can also fly underwater. NASA's data might prove the moon isn't what we've been told. And Michio Kaku just pulled the curtain back. According to Michio Kaku, buried in decades of lunar research are clues that could rewrite the moon's entire story. And NASA hasn't exactly been shouting them from the rooftops. Well, that's the problem. The James Webb Space Telescope is upsetting the apple cart. All of a sudden, we realize that we may have to rewrite all the textbooks about the beginning of the universe. This part blew my mind because if it were coming from just anyone, I might have brushed it off. But this is Michio Kaku we're talking about. He's not just a random theorist throwing ideas around online. Kaku is a theoretical physicist, co-founder of string field theory, a best-selling author, and a regular voice on major science networks. He has spent decades explaining quantum, physics, cosmology, and the future of humanity and space to the public. And here's what makes his words hit harder. Kaku's track record includes bold predictions that years later turned out to be surprisingly accurate. He's spoken about black holes, time travel, concepts, the multiverse, topics mainstream science once dismissed, that have since gained serious research interest. So when he says NASA hasn't been fully open about certain moon findings, it's worth listening. He frames it not as a conspiracy theory, but as a symptom of a larger problem. Space agencies holding back data under the banner of strategic interest or national security. What do you think? Should governments have the right to withhold space discoveries from the public if they think we're not ready? Or should space belong to everyone? And here's where it gets even stranger. Kaku claims NASA has collected, and in some cases, classified, lunar data that could change how we see Earth's only natural satellite. According to him, the Apollo missions, later unmanned probes, and orbital mapping missions have revealed anomalies, geological, seismic, and possibly even visual, that never made it to the public press conferences. Some were archived quietly, others were released decades later long after public interest faded. Kaku isn't saying NASA fabricated anything. He's suggesting they've selectively shared only what aligns with the standard moon is a dead rock narrative, leaving out the oddities that might spark bigger questions. Why? His view is that space exploration has always been part science, part politics. Certain findings, like the presence of abundant lunar resources or unexplained seismic events, might give rival nations an edge if revealed too soon. Here's the kicker. Some of this information was only uncovered when researchers dug through raw mission data themselves, meaning the files were technically public, but buried so deep that no casual researcher would stumble upon them. That would you have done in NASA's shoes? Share everything instantly or play the long game? Just when it seems straightforward, the moon's geology added a twist. Kaku points to its bizarre surface composition and internal structure as one of NASA's most under-discussed topics. For starters, the moon's crust contains unusually high concentrations of heavy metals like titanium and uranium in certain regions, far higher than what we see on Earth's crust. Even stranger, these metals are often found right on the surface, not buried deep underground. That's not how planetary geology usually works. Then there's the hollow moon angle, not in the sci-fi sense of a giant spaceship, but about Apollo seismic experiments. When lunar modules crashed into the surface, seismometers detected a ringing vibration that lasted far longer than expected, almost like the moon was reverberating. Some scientists chalk this up to its dry, fractured rock structure. Others weren't so sure. Add to that the fact that the moon's far side has a drastically different crust thickness and composition compared to the near side, and you've got a geological puzzle that still isn't fully explained. Kaku's point. If the moon's makeup defies standard formation models, we either need new science or a deeper look at what NASA already knows. So if you found evidence that didn't match the accepted theory, would you publish it or wait until you had a neat explanation? This part made me stop and think, because earthquakes on Earth are one thing, but moonquakes, those are a whole different mystery. During the Apollo missions, 
astronauts left seismometers on the moon's surface. Over the years, these instruments picked up four distinct types of seismic activity, deep moon quakes, shallow moon quakes, thermal quakes from temperature changes, and vibrations from meteorite impacts. Here's the weird part. Some shallow moon quakes were surprisingly strong, reaching up to magnitude 5.5. That's powerful enough to crack plaster walls back on Earth. And they didn't seem to fit the pattern scientists expected from a geologically dead world. Even stranger, these quakes could last for hours. Compare that to a typical earthquake, which usually subsides in seconds or minutes. The moon seems to reverberate like a giant bell. That's the same phenomenon Kaku brought up when talking about its strange internal structure. Some researchers think the quakes could be caused by tidal forces from Earth's gravity flexing the moon's crust. Others suspect there might be more going on beneath the surface, perhaps unexplored geological or even volcanic activity. If the moon isn't as dormant as we've been told, what else could be lurking beneath its dusty surface? And here's where it gets even more surprising, because for decades, the official stance was that the moon was bone dry. No atmosphere, no liquid water, no chance. But then, around the late 2000s, NASA and other space agencies started quietly revising that claim. Instruments detected signatures of hydroxyl molecules and water ice in the moon's polar regions, trapped in permanently shadowed craters where sunlight never reaches. Some of these icy deposits could be billions of years old, preserved since the moon's earliest days. For future space exploration, that's a game changer. Water can be used for drinking, oxygen production, and even fuel if split into hydrogen and oxygen. Kaku points out something important here. NASA had hints of water-related compounds decades earlier from Apollo rock samples and Soviet Luna missions, but it wasn't widely publicized. It wasn't until newer missions like India's Chandrayaan, one confirmed it that the story shifted. If that information had been emphasized sooner, it might have changed public perception of lunar exploration entirely. Imagine if the desert moon had always been marketed as a potentially resource-rich outpost. Do you think this discovery was simply overlooked or quietly set aside until the timing was right? Just when you think the moon's mysteries are all about rocks and ice, this curveball hits, strange lights flashing on its surface. For centuries, astronomers have reported what's now called transient lunar phenomena. Brief localized glows, flashes, or color changes on the moon some last seconds, others minutes. The earliest documented cases go back to the 1600s, long before modern telescopes. Kaku mentions that even in the Apollo era, astronauts reported seeing strange glimmers. Some were brushed off as reflections or cosmic ray hits on the eyes. But here's the kicker. Some TLPs have been observed from multiple locations on Earth at the same time, ruling out equipment glitches. NASA has never fully explained these events, Theories range from gas escaping through fissures to electrostatic discharges to meteor impacts throwing up reflective dust clouds. Still, the phenomenon remains unconfirmed and unpredictable. What makes this even more intriguing is that certain lunar regions seem to get more TLP activity, especially near old volcanic domes or crater rims. Coincidence or something deeper? If you saw a bright, unexplained flash on the moon tonight, would you assume a natural cause or wonder if something was watching back. And finally, this part feels like science fiction, but it's solid astronomy. The moon's orbit and formation are odd. First, its size relative to Earth is unusual. Most planets with moons have much smaller satellites compared to their own. Ours is huge, over a quarter the diameter of Earth. The Earth-Moon system is more like a double planet than a typical planet-moon pairing. Then there's its orbit, the moon is moving away from Earth at about 3.8 centimeters per year. That's measurable, thanks to reflectors placed by Apollo astronauts. Run the math backward and you hit a point where the moon would have been so close, tides would have been catastrophic. As for how it formed, the leading theory is the giant impact hypothesis, that a Mars-sized body collided with early Earth, ejecting debris that formed the moon. But here's the catch. Moon rocks are nearly identical in isotopic composition to Earth's mantle, far more than the models predict. Kaku suggests we still don't have the full story and that NASA may have data that challenges the neat textbook version. If the moon's origin is stranger than we think, 
that changes how we understand our entire solar system's history. Would you be ready to accept a new origin theory if it broke every rule in the book? Here's where strategy comes into play, because NASA's current roadmap doesn't just end at the moon. It uses the moon as a launch pad for something much bigger, Mars. Kaku points out that the moon offers the perfect testing ground for long duration space missions. It's close enough for quick communication and rescue, but still harsh enough to simulate the challenges of interplanetary travel. Extreme temperatures, radiation exposure, and the need for total self-sufficiency. And with water ice at the poles, astronauts could manufacture fuel right there on the surface. That means you wouldn't have to haul everything from Earth, making missions to Mars faster and cheaper. But here's the twist. Kaku hints that NASA's focus on the moon might be about more than just logistics. If there are still unpublicized resources or discoveries up there, those could quietly become the backbone of deep space exploration. So the question is, are we going back to the moon purely for research or because there's something there we need for the next big leap? This part might stir up some strong feelings because while the Apollo missions were a triumph for science, they also left a trail of unanswered questions. During Apollo, astronauts collected over 800 pounds of lunar rock and soil. While much of it was studied and cataloged, some samples were sealed away for decades, only recently opened with modern technology. Why wait so long? Kaku points out that there's nothing inherently wrong with storing samples for future analysis, but combined with classified mission footage and gaps in public reporting, it fuels suspicion. Even some seismic and atmospheric data from Apollo instruments took years to be released. NASA says it's about ensuring accurate interpretation and avoiding premature conclusions. Skeptics think it's about controlling the narrative. And when you mix in anomalies like moonquakes, unexplained lights, and unexpected water, the secrecy angle becomes even harder to ignore. Some researchers argue that these unexplained lunar events could point to geological processes we don't yet understand, while others believe they may hint at artificial or unknown activity. Either way, the combination of scientific caution and selective disclosure keeps the mystery alive, fueling speculation among space enthusiasts and conspiracy theorists alike. If the moon holds surprises we're not ready for, who decides when we are ready to hear them? Whenever new lunar findings make headlines, the public response splits almost instantly. Excitement on one side, doubt on the other. Some people embrace Kaku's claims, pointing to decades of odd lunar data and saying, finally someone's connecting the dots. Others dismiss it as speculation without hard proof. Scientists tend to fall somewhere in the middle. Most agree there are unanswered questions about the moon, but they want reproducible evidence before rewriting textbooks. That's the nature of science, slow, methodical, and sometimes frustratingly cautious. The bigger challenge is trust. When agencies withhold or delay data, it leaves room for conspiracy theories to grow. And once the public starts doubting official explanations, even legitimate findings can be met with suspicion. So is skepticism protecting the truth or delaying it? If even half of what Kaku suggests is true, it changes the game for science, exploration, and maybe even geopolitics. First, a geologically active moon or one rich in hidden resources would make it a prime location for permanent bases. Whoever controls those resources could control the pace of deep space exploration. Second, if our understanding of the moon's origin is incomplete, it could rewrite our entire view of Earth's history and force us to rethink planetary science. Finally, it could spark a new kind of space race. We've already seen renewed interest from China, Russia, India, and private companies. If the moon holds strategic value, the next decade could see a scramble not unlike the Cold War. But this time, it's not about planting a flag. It's about staying there. Would we be ready for that shift or would it catch us off guard? So maybe the moon isn't just a silent rock hanging in the sky. Maybe it's the key to our future and our past. If you thought this was wild, you'll want to see what Kaku says about Mars. Drop your thoughts below and subscribe for more deep space revelations.